this final biodiversity gardens online capacity workshop 2.0. A quick recap from our first talk in this second series, we were with Chan Zixiang or Z from Langi Collective, where he has shared with us his experience in regenerative farming. Then Adam Kamal from the Tropical Rainforest Conservation and Research Center, TRCRC, brought us into the magnificent an amazing world of our native trees and ways to conserve and reintroduce these trees in the city. Last week, Jolene from Langa Project Penang taught us on how you, as Malaysian citizens, could contribute to citizen science through her experience working with people from various backgrounds. Today, we are with Mr. Afan from UM Water Warriors on the topic of drains, small ponds, and wetlands. To those who aren't familiar with Ubi, Ubi is short for Urban Biodiversity Initiative. OB is an independent collective for urban ecology research, conservation, and environment. Shuhada and I am your moderator for today. Before we proceed, a reminder to all of you, if throughout the session you have any questions, just drop your questions in the Q&A box or the chat box. We are also streaming live on Facebook, so to you guys who are watching us from Facebook, you can drop your questions. all of your questions. Let's go to our end with funding from the Habitat Foundation and the UNDP GEF Small Grants Program aims to develop knowledge and skills of Mr. Afan Nasaruddin as he explains the importance of drains, small ponds, and wetlands, as well as shares ways to monitor and conserve them. He is also currently researching place-based citizen science for Sungai Klang and Sungai Selangor River Basins and co-manages Rumah No. 2, University Malaya as an environmental education space. Together with his wife, Asya, and a community group of Mukim Pasangan, he also co-founded Inspirasi Kawa, a youth environmental club in Kuala Selangor. That's all from me. I'll be passing the stage to Afan. So Afan, whenever you are ready. All right, thank you, Shu. So um, I will sh share my screen. Okay, hi everyone. Um, <laughs> so first of all, I would like to um, thank to Ubi and Kota Damansara Community Forest Society for organizing this uh, webinar, and also the Habitat Foundation, and also UNDP GEF Small Grants Program supporting supporting this project with this webinar. Um, I'll feel even though I'll I talk a few into in a few webinars before, uh, I still feel awkward because uh, it feels I feels like talking the fine screens once around shots nearly. Uh, I think I miss the human contact kind of conference talks. Um, but so I will try my best to explain and to share a little bit um, my experience uh, on the grounds working with drains, ponds and wetlands. So, um, okay. So a little bit background, um, that's me. Um, I'm currently, I'm working uh, as a project officer in University of Malaya uh, under a project called Water Warriors. Uh, with, and Sitron Rasia actually is my partner and also my wife. Um, both of us co-founded the Water Warriors uh, 
since 2013 and uh, just after we graduate and we form that group so uh, asia is her background is on she's from engineering faculties and i'm from applied geology course all right so a little bit um a little bit background about water warriors why is water warriors um so it's quite difficult for me to explain especially when when people ask me uh what is water warriors uh which faculties uh you are under so um so to keep it simple uh water warriors is sort of like ngo in the in the university of malaya um but we are focusing on water conservation efforts so basically we are under um sustainability living labs secretariat so under that secretariat we have a different team um for example we have zero waste campaign which is focusing on waste um we have the rainbow project focusing on urban biodiversities and greening and we also have transportations um and, and many uh that's a few more so basically water warriors um is a group of volunteers um either there's there's staff there's students uh there's lecturers who are concerned about water water bodies in university of malaya so we get together and we try to solve the problem and also water warriors working on uh water environmental education so if you can see on the background we are teaching kids about um wetlands pond or uh, restoring um uh, restoring a lake and also monitoring the river and lakes so basically how it started um it started since uh back in 2013 um at that time i was quite lucky i'm working with dr zida so she's here so i work as a uh, ra at that time i was just uh, an undergrad i just finished my undergrad so um during that time i had a chance to go to the japan to present a poster so uh, at that time i was like so that's my first academic journey or in university malaya on presenting a poster something like that so at that time i was quite impressed with japan so macam like biasalah we are tourists when we are we are from we go to the different country we always amaze what other country uh why um so and we also keep on i think the the what you got the stigma say that japan is way better it's way cleaner they they are very good in keeping the environment so when i went there when i see myself oh it's really true so so it get um so i basically i have some why we say uh like like a hinge um how can we talk about other places when we are not even thinking about solving the problem at our own place first and at that time uh, i was thinking um there's a um yeah like academic paper uh, academic person they always go do research about the other places but in the context of a university itself nobody is taking care so that's really hit me so when i back, went back to um so this is how the tacit varsity looks like in 2013 so uh if you can see is uh the top left pictures and in the second is what we call it eutrophication uh, enrichment of nutrients basically in 2013 the tacit varsity become a dead place nobody dares to go there um it's like a zombie place there's rubbish and in the bottom on the right if you can see 
there's even squirrel die inside the lake. So I was a fresh graduate and I was semangat lah uh, balik from Japan and then I want to try to do something. So I spent most of my time at that time at the lake almost every day, including weekends. Um, so I'm a person who just langga everything. Uh, I, I don't expect people to do it. Uh, I just do it myself. You can see uh, I'm trying to fix a trash trap that's entered to the lake. Uh, hi, Afan. Yes. Your slide is not moving. Ah, it's not moving. Yeah. Oh, uh, all right. Uh, so where is it now? I think it's still uh the slide one. Slide one. Oh. oh, sorry, sorry, my mistake. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> all right, all right, okay, <laughs> All right, so um, so at that time, I, I spent a lot of time uh, at the lake, and Asia also teman me uh, at that time. So basically, just two of us at a very dirty lake. Uh, nobody dared to come. Um, people look at us weird. Apa benda lah dua orang budak ni buat dekat tasik, uh, masuk dalam tasik, everything. So, but I keep on doing it. So, on the left, on the right side, I'm doing a little bit monitoring. So, Asia really uh, into history. So, basically, she's went back to the archive, uh, UM University archive, and she went through all the materials. And basically, that's when we when we talk about Tasik Varsity, um, that, that, that's a history about Tasik Varsity. So usually, when people talk, talk about history, usually people talk about um, people of, or, or a, a building, but not an environment place, uh, a park like Tasik Varsity. When we when we look back at the um, at the magazine. At the, with uh, old magazine, the Tasik Varsity is much alive compared to at that time, 2013. And it's a part of UM history that we need to highlight it back. So basically, she's uh, Asya made a video. Um, so uh, Shaming will uh, share the video on the chat room. Uh, you can see the history of the Tasik Varsity. So during at that time, uh, I think those in these pictures um, is around 60s and 70s. You can see students uh, pillow fight inside the lake, catching the ducks, uh, have sampan kayu-kayu during the congregation, uh, congregation festivals. So it's very lovely and lively. So um, after we produced the videos, uh, we did some uh, little bit cleanups. The top management realized that uh, the top management realized that there's someone working on the lake, but he doesn't know who, 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 who are they. So basically they call us and we are part, so basically to cut short, we are part of the uh, restoration of the Varsity Lake. The project called Revival, Revive Varsity Lake. So the project started in 2014. Uh, we have um, we have three phases. The first phase, the first six months is more on research. The second uh, phase is on fixing, and the third phase on introducing life. So um, we want to make this project sort of like. Involve, we want to try to involve the community. So usually uh, when we do development in the campus, the, the person who involved actually the development units and the contractors. But in the project revival, uh, we try to sort of include the inner community, which is the staff, the students, to see on the uh, to go on the ground and to be involved. So at least they know what's the project is all about and they are part of this revival project so if you can see this 
uh, in this photo. Um, the students, the lecturers come from different faculties, uh, go inside the, inside the lake and picking up the trash. Um, when we did the cleanup, I think the most um, interesting item that we found was um, a car clamps. There's a lot of car clamps. Uh, this is a, a, around six. There's a washing machine inside the lake. Um, it, we even found a diskette. So I think the kids nowadays doesn't know what diskette is. Um, the big one. <laughs> um, we found handphones, monies. There's a lot of sort of uh, treasure. And lastly, after we the project completed around uh, ten to eleven months. So this is how the lakes looks like right now. So um, the lakes. The lakes getting uh, the water quality getting uh, getting better uh, is suitable for body contact. So basically, the students, the, uh, the community can do recreational such as in kayak, and even uh, we have a few uh, water spots at the lake. So um, that's the history of water warriors. Th that's the first project of water warriors. So after that, um, after the after the revival project, the management asked us to look into other things. So basically, we have a bigger responsibles. Um, the the university asked us to uh, to do on water savings, uh, to look into uh, the rivers, the drain. So so at that time, we are working. So currently, we are working closely with development unit of uh, UM on regarding this matter. So um, for this presentation, uh, the webinar session, I'm going to sort of like separate it into drain, pond, and wetland first. And at, 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 at last, I will try to integrate all those uh, elements together. So basically, drains uh, in Bahasa we call longkang. So, um, like I say, I, I feel awkward talking alone. Uh, I'll try my best to. At least we have an interaction section. So we have a quiz. So uh, anyone in Zoom, they, they can join, uh, or even in FB, they can just write on their comments. So Shamin will uh, post a, a poll. So uh, the first question, the first quiz is, which one is a drain? So you can answer. All right, let's wait a few seconds. And let's see how, what's the result. Shami, uh, is the is it the result out yet? Oh, all right. Okay. So basically, um, most of the audience uh, attending attendees um choose b so and some of you choose a <laughs> so basically um so, so b is the correct answer <laughs> so a and c actually is a river uh a is sungai pantai and c is sungai pencala um after this, I'm going to talk a little bit on A and C uh, a little bit a moment. So basically, people know what is the difference between drains and the river. So basically, when we when we heard about the rivers, this is our stereotype. So basically, uh, I talk about long uh, the drain. So basically, this is the the stereotype. So this is the typical. Uh, 
Longkang in Malaysia is smelly. Uh, there's a lot of trash, uh, oil, fats. Uh, sometimes we can see cockroach, uh, rats. <laughs> so, so this is what happened. Um, I think most of us, uh, if you are in suppose suppose that's supposed not to, not to happen because um all all that effluent is actually is from silage is from the wastewater from the kitchens um so basically let's go back to the the, the real function of the drain so um lots of people think that drain is to channel wastewater uh, to basically to discharge everything into the drain, but actually it's not. Uh, the function of the, the drain actually the longkang actually is to drain rainwater only. So kalau kita tengok balik uh, our houses, um, is your drain dry or is it wet? So if it's wet, meaning that you are discharging illegally into the drain and which and flow into our river so basically um so this is very typical um uh, situation in malaysia whereas the most the from the kitchen and also from the washing machines the discharge directly into the longkang and the long count will go to the, to the to the river so the the proper way is is you to, you need we need to channel like the dishwasher and the washing uh, all the wastewater to the sewage sewer line so um so how we should solve it so the first so if your houses are discharging into the Maybe you, what you can do is the first one try to connect back your sewer, uh, the wastewater back to the sewer line. All these another options. Um, so basically, in rumah number two, there's a, there's a renovated bus that we turn into Airbnb. So if you can see, there's a sink uh, inside the bus. So if you can see the wastewater from the sink, we uh, channel like a channel into a filtration system, which is there's in the container, there's a, a few that it, it contains sand and some pebbles and plants basically to filter the water. So before before it discharged to the to the on the ground. So it's it's much cleaner. So what makes a good drain? So the first thing, um, like I said, our drain is supposed to be dry uh, unless it's in the groundwater seepage. Uh, so it's clean, no rubbish, no blockage, uh, in good conditions, in such a, uh, such a manner. It's flowing, it's not stagnant, there's no smell, uh, well maintained, and a little bit bonus. Uh, there's some life, like mosses, guppy, tadpoles, etc. So, um, so this uh, is what I call agenda melongkang kan. Uh, we this uh, we go back to the quiz um, at the beginning, like someone say that sungai pantai is a longkang. Uh, I'm I'm not try to blame them that they doesn't they they didn't do they orang tak tahu yang itu longkang uh, yang itu sungai. But the structure of the river itself and the the environment around it make it like a longkang, sort of. So basically, the agenda melongkang kani um it started started way during the 60s, 70s um where they need to solve flooding issues. So basically, they channelize the rivers, um. And they, they try to make it straight so that the water flow during the heavy rainfalls, the waters 
flow from A to B is much more faster to the main river. So when I did a survey around with the commu uh, UM community, semua orang tak tahu there's a river in, uh, in UM. So they always assume that this river is a big drain, a big longkang, which is quite sad. Um, because the name itself still Sungai Pantai, but the condition and the structures manner and people's perception and how we uh, discharge all the wastewater into the rivers and it make uh, it make looks like a long come. So um, just what sort of life can be found in urban rivers? Okay, that's the next quiz. Shamin? Maybe you can guess um, what kind of life that we can found in our urban rivers. So it's a multiple choice. Okay, let's show the result. <laughs> so yeah, frogs, fish, wildflower, dragonfly, <laughs> pig, palm tree. Oh, no life. <laughs> so um, when we did a survey in our urban river in the uh, in the campus. So this is some of uh, biodiversity that we can found. Yeah, it's butterfly, dragonfly, uh, wildflower, tadpoles, fish. So there's a lot of interesting uh, biodiversity. Um, especially if you notice our urban river is made up from precast uh, concrete. So all this life actually uh, hid up the, the crack whereas the structures uh, rosa or pecah because our precast concrete our urban rivers if originally is is not supporting life at all so with the crack here and there so that are uh, the the animals the plants manage to survive so um, i'm not going to talk this uh, in detail so maybe that's can, gonna be a next session so um okay this is another agenda melongkangkan um we received this video from our friend uh from bukit kiara so it used on the right side there's there's a stream basically and and now they they're doing some developments and the stream itself they Melongkangkan, they channelize it into a longkang. So this is quite sad to see because um, especially in uh, urban context where stream is quite fresh, uh, uh, precious and people doesn't value it and when it became a longkang, when you cover it up, uh, people will start ignore it, uh, people will start throwing rubbish, discharge uh wastewater here and there so this is quite a big loss and i was really quite sad to see this happening so basically there's a few uh alternatives out there uh on drainage uh which is quite what we call it ecological um uh, friendly so this is one of examples uh in Engineering, engineering campus in USM, uh, the, the system called bioecological drainage system. Basically, you can see there's, uh, in this campus, there's no longkang at all. There's no drain, meaning that there's no concrete precast drain. So everything is uh, earth, earth, earth drain. So basically, they, they, try, they dig uh, a hole and they place a, 
a modular, the black thing, and then they, they cover it up. So basically during the rainfall, the water will seep in to, to the modular and flow into uh, into, into a lower a lo lower area which is um during during the water when the water the, when the rainwater enter the modulum um sort of like filtration so there's a cleaning there's uh increase in oxygen levels so basically they improve the water quality so you can have a look um so there's a few example also in kl using this kind of methods. So, so next, ponds. So um, I'm not so sure most of us have ponds uh, at their house. So basically this uh, typical pond in urban areas. So some of, some of it used for aesthetic, some of it uh, to, to, to build ikan. Um, and most probably we can relate and most of the our kids uh, in the school have a column column is a taman science in the taman science they have column uh, we also have column renang it's a swimming pool uh, in and the next one is on development we have a col uh, sedimentation pond so each pond have different function and we set the function itself but usually um, the pond, even though it is function for a certain thing, but when we go to the urban context, um, the pond become a, to be a universal. Sort of, uh, for example, um, I, I live in my, my in, in uh, apartment, so there's a swimming pool. I, I can see that pigeon, uh, birds are taking a bath, uh, drinks the water from the swimming pools. Um, yeah, so uh, that's one of my friends, uh, they, he had a fish pond uh, at the house and every night an owl will come there and try to eat the fish. So basically um, what we are intended to do, uh, sort of original we intended to do, but somehow this kind of wildlife uh join us join together so basically the benefits co-sharing benefits sort of like that so so there's another um why don't we make a wildlife pond so basically this uh one of the example this in a uh, rimba elmo uh in the courtyard so it's quite it's not very big um the pond there's a lots of life actually the, the, the intention of this pond actually to uh, to attract wildlife uh here so basically you can see at the spawn um there's frogs there's uh, dragonflies there's water striders so basically there's a lots of wildlife inside the spawn so so this kind of uh, trend in Malaysia is not very popular, but if you go to the UK or to the Europe area, this, this wildlife pond is quite uh, common for them. So um, I, I, had, I had no experience yet uh, building a wildlife pond, but Terry will be uh, experimenting in uh, one of the areas so basically there's there's a uh, lots of uh, materials uh, reference that you can google and how to make a wildlife pond um, maybe some of you are quite uh, worried about mosquitoes um, what what you can do is to introduce some guppies uh, at least the guppies will eat the mosquito larvae so uh, there's a there's a reference book, uh, a guide to freshwater, 
So this book, you can uh, Google it. There's a PDF file. So it's quite interesting to look at it. So wetlands, tanah bencah, bahasa. So um, there's a lot of wetland in Malaysia. So the, the most famous one is uh, wetland, uh, Putrajaya wetland. So I, I choose Putrajaya wetland is because uh, I live in Putrajaya. Um, so yeah, that's the reason why I choose it. Um, all right. So basically, what is wetland and how does it work? So basically, there's uh, incoming flow, streams, and basically, uh, we, we enter a pond. Uh, and at that pond, there's uh, plants. So that plants, we call it wetland plants. So these wetland plants will help to filter the water. So basically how they filter it. So the roots of the wetland plants will uptake all the nutrients and it, the nutrient is good for, for the plants, for growth. And by doing that, naturally the water become more clear, cleaner. So um, it's not just for filtration, um, the wetlands can provide habitats uh, there's a lot of other function and basically after the filtration process the water overflow uh, the outflow of the water is much more cleaner compared to the inner, uh, inlet so basically you can um, maybe you can have a visit in uh, Putrajaya, uh, Putrajaya wetland you can see how the whole process whereas the the incoming, the incoming uh, rivers are quite dirty are quite turbid and after a few filtration process, uh, the water quality is become very, very good. So these sort of a few functions of wetlands, filter water, provide food and erosion controls, uh, foods and home for the fish and wildlife because wetland is when some, some of them might think that wetland is quite messy, quite um, tak cantik, <laughs> because there's a lot of, and they, they, they assume that it's a semak. So, but actually that kind of semak, that kind of messiness, uh, wildness, and also it brings a lot of biodiversity of uh, plants and animals. So during the uh, period of excessive seed rains, wetland can absorb and slow the uh, flood water, absorb excess nutrients. Uh, it's a great spot uh, for fishing uh, and bird watching, especially in Putrajaya. There's uh, one place called, uh, area is called Upper Bisa. There's a lot of uh, water birds there, and a migratory birds always uh, stay there. So um, also lastly is enjoyable outdoor classroom. So people can learn a lot of things about wetland. So um, this is scenarios in an urban context where currently our development, uh, developer always try to build uh, residentials uh, near the pond, uh, near in front the lake view because it sells. <laughs> um, and the property's price is much higher but I think it's quite funny, uh, funny sometimes because uh, there's a few um, uh, the housing areas where the developers sort of like cheat them um, for example there's one in Putrajaya itself um, they, they sell it as a lake view, but when people buy it, they, they, they sort of like want to see a, a lake, but that place actually is a wetland area. So when there's, oh, it's a wetland area, there's a lots of trees, uh, there's the, the water is a bit, it's a bit murky, murky. Uh, so people are complaining it. So um, 
So in this picture is uh, is a plant called Hangwana Malayana or uh, it's called Bakum. The Bakum grew is a quite quite high, and basically at that areas uh, they block all the view of the sort of lake. So they asked the council to cut all the bakum uh, at the area. So I quite um, it's quite sad <laughs> because um, at that time because people doesn't know the difference between wetlands and lakes. So people assume that I think yeah they, they got cheated. Um, and there's another one in Damansara, where usually um, the sedimentation pond during during the construction of the uh, housing area or development uh, um, building, the developer need to build a sedimentation pond. So basically, um, after finishing the project, so um, the usually the developer we remain the sedimentation pond. Um, there. Uh, to, to just to keep because uh, if you want to close it, uh, it costs a lot of money for them. So they just leave it there. And people are buying bungalows over there. And during the rain time, raining season, a lot of muddy water came uh, into the lakes. And basically, the whole pond become tetare. So people keep on complaining. So. <laughs> So um, they already bought the the house. So I think we need to be, be careful on the term of sedimentation pond, uh, the lake itself, and the wetland. So uh, okay, drains, ponds, and wetland. So basically, I will try to combine these elements together. So uh, a few weeks ago, so um. This is not in Venice, it is in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, one week before that, we, especially in uh, Kelang Valley area, we have no water at all. And after one week, we have too much water. So yeah. So what the reason, uh, if you can see in the Google Earth, uh, this is Masjid Yame. And if you can see, there's, in the upper stream of Masjid Jamit, there's a lot of development. Uh, there's less green uh, space here, and so what you can so we are expecting worse. Uh, basically, during at that time, um, because of the high intensity, so I think without the smart tunnel, I think most probably part. Part of the most of the part of the KLs is going to be flooded. So uh, after that, uh, basically after an incident, uh, like Banjir, everything, so the authorities start to kaji semula everything arahan pembangunan for avoid avoid the flash flood, uh, tambah tambah kolam takungan, uh, is flight uh, flight retentions. But actually. It's not it's not one way how we want to solve these kind of uh, issues. Uh, if you're similar with a sponge sponge city concept, so that's a lot. This is what we need in our development in, in our context. Uh, we need a pond, a lakes, a uh, rainwater garden, a uh, green roof, from US pavement open canals uh, to slow them to basically to absorb all the waters and um, if you can notice usually in September we uh, last year we have a haze and by this year we have lots of rains so basically this is what a climate change uh, happening so yeah so there's another example in Chulalongkorn Sanitary Parks so basically in Bangkok, Bangkok is quite similar with Kuala Lumpur, uh, whereas the, the city is, is nearby a river and the population keep on growing and growing and growing. So um, there's uh, this uh, lady um, 
in Kot Varkum. Varkum. Uh, she's a landscape architect. So, so basically, her project, um, the, the project is called uh, Anti Flight Park. So basically, she turned, uh, she turned the park into a little bit diagonal. So there's up and down. So when it rains, most of the surface runoff run going to the down. Whereas the, at the downside, there's a lots of pond, there's a wetland. So this is what we need now. So basically, we need to work together. Um, we are not currently engineers. We need to work together with landscape uh, architect. We need to work with hydrologists. So we need a transdisciplinary people in solving the climate issues. So um, I do uh, some people to ask Malaysia tak ada ke all, all these uh, guideline or everything, but if actually Malaysia have, so the uh, the, the department of the irrigation and drainage they, they have a manual called a burn storm water management manual for Malaysia. So in this topic, there's uh, there's a lots of topic on water quality pond, uh, water quality pond and wetlands, drains and swill, bioretention system, gross pollutant trap and there's there's many more so basically you can download it uh, it's free so uh, I just, a few slides left um, I would like to show a little bit case study that I, uh, that I have been working on so basically the, the first case study is uh, at the faculty of science in New Zealand so this is uh, back in 2013 there's uh, basically is um, it's an alo ai, which is nobody nobody care about it before. Um, so basically, me, uh, my, me and my friends, uh, Abalan, help to clear the areas and to revive back this sort of like stream. So when we did that, we there's there's a lots of um, we create a small park, basically. So basically, there's there's ducks over there. So uh, people are enjoying uh, this area, and people start to came to this area. Before this, people just take a look, and nobody care about this. So, but uh, there's an incident uh, happens a uh, few years after that. So there's flight occur. So the the faculty and the development office. Um, decided to enlarge the areas uh, we cannot save the stream anymore uh, but at the beginning it was quite ugly <laughs> it was a very structural uh, kind of um, we call it not so, kind of structure a concrete structure something like that but after one, after after few months, the plants came back. So basically, um, all this plant actually is not being uh, is naturally occurred. So tumbuh sendiri. There's uh, we didn't do anything. So basically, it act as a, a pond and a wetland uh, cells. So basically, there's we have a three layers. And if you can see the large one is the, the, the biggest one is the first layer. At the first layers, there's a few uh, wetlands plants, and at these layers, there's a lot we there's a lot of garbage. So basically it extracts a lot of uh, trash before it goes to the uh, to the river. So uh, another case study in UM is uh, called uh, Sungai Mustafa uh, in U so basically, this area also used to be a longkang, um, but the water actually is is a, uh, if it's from uh, Bukit, Ay Bukit. Um, they melongkangkan, but the longkang already pecah, and after a few years, they didn't do anything, and nature did taste. And if you can see the flows, uh, the flow of the streams, uh, it's a bit Mandarin. So at so we did a project uh, reviving this space. 
um, uh, with, with the development office. So we create a small park, uh, this area. So, um, so basically there's, uh, we try to maintain the stream, we try to restore the bank and we create a, a, a yeah, a, a park sort of, because uh, there's, there's not many park in uh, UM. So we try to create a small, small patches of parts. So basically people came here for lunch uh, and also they can studies, gatherings, and yeah, this is the, the newest uh, project that I uh, involved is in UM Greenbelt. So this project, yeah, so in the red line actually is a drain. So before this project uh, happened, so the water from the drains is go directly into the river. This is called Sungai Pantai. So after, um, so basically we had collaboration with DBKLs uh, we create a, a pond and a constructed wetland and there's a stream goes to the Tasi University. So basically to, because Tasi University is quite a dead lake uh, because there's no water inlets. Uh, when they channelize the rivers uh, during the 60s and uh, during the 70s, uh, the water flow, the water level of the river is quite low compared to the lake. So uh, it's quite difficult to channel back the uh, river water back to the lake. So this is one of the our op uh, uh, other options. So basically, this is how it looks like now. Um, so basically, there's there's a before we make a dam. Uh, we make a dam at the drain and the water flow to the, the orange one is called sedimentation pond and then we are at the green uh, box is a uh, constructed wetland so basically uh, and the drain are quite a little bit polluted so that's the reason why we have constructed wetland so at least to filter the, the pollutants so when we did that um, we have a mix um, where mix uh, pandangan, opinions, <laughs> because some because uh, this wetland pass located uh, just uh, beside the main road, so some people thought that what this again samak is quite messy, uh, but it's supposed to do uh, it's, look, it's supposed to look like that, so they they. They contacted us and see oh what's what is this why is it messy um, so but in function in practicality if you can see it's during great uh, heavy rainfalls the the stream the wetlands play very important parts so if you can see the water quite high so basically it act as a sponge and it divert uh, rainwater from to it to go to it directly to the Sungai Pantai. So that's a lot of um, even though that is messy it while um, yeah we is this is proof that there's a lot of biodiversity. Um, there's a wildflowers, there's snails, the aquatic, there's fish there, and this place become sort of. Um, a place where where the community can spend their times with their families, just enjoy the view and can play just chilok kaki, man with the anana ikan. There's yeah, it's quite a nice place. So okay, this is my end slide. Alright, so um, so when people look at this picture, maybe some of the people think that. These pictures, uh, there's, there's, a, there's some problem in this area, but for me, this is quite the best. Uh, whereas, because this area, when it when it's when it's rain, it holds water, and but when it uh, dry, when it's uh, there's uh, there's no rain, it become dry. 
So we need sort of like these areas. And if you notice in urban context, lots of our padang, our fields, football fields become uh, turf. Uh, there's no more penetrations. Uh, so we have very limiting uh, infiltration uh, on the naturally infiltration in the urban context. So, all right. So that's all. Um, I hope, yeah. You enjoy, uh, so yeah. I try to my best to answer the questions. Okay, thank you, Afan. All right, so we will uh, proceed with the Q and A session. So those who have any questions, just put it in the chat box or in the Q and A box. For those on Facebook, just put it in the comment. I'll try to read on both sides. We already have some questions coming in from Zoom. All right, so the first question is, there are too much concrete in urban areas. What is your view that cities and towns need to be designed in such a way that the ground is more porous to be able to minimize flash flood? So basically, there's, there's a lot of materials out there, uh, porous uh, materials out there. It depends on the authority, the person who wants to invest it. Because sometimes um, they look into dollar and cents. Um, but if our government or our authorities, uh, for example, in Kuala Lumpur itself, DBKL already decided all building must have rainwater, a uh, rainwater harvesting system. So that kind is, is a compulsory. So we need that kind of um, guide, um, sort of like policies that uh, in our new development. So how many waters we need to uh, need to be infiltrate into the ground. So yeah, that's my opinion. Right. For the next question, also from the same person, Yohumi. Algae in ponds and lake is a natural occurrence. However, when does when does it become a problem affecting oxygen content and health of the lake or pond and habitat? All right, okay, that's a very good question. Uh, so basically, um, when there's a lot of nutrients, so um, yeah. So basically, if you if you notice uh, the slide that you uh, on the Tasik University itself. It shows that when the algae is quite thick, uh, there's a lot of nutrients. Um, when it's, there's a lot of nutrients, um, it, the, what, the, the sunlight cannot penetrate. So the, the, oxygen, uh, the oxygen is going to be dropped and that makes the, the, the fish die. So I think if we make a wildlife pond, uh, we're using, we, we don't have to feed anything. Um, so I think that's quite okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, I think once the, the algae is covered up every, uh, on, on the surface, uh, that might be a problem. Or, yeah. All right. Um... Okay, for any of you guys still have any questions, um, still could we have a bit more time still. So while waiting for others to probably think of uh, questions or probably your opinions or sharing of experience, we I thought you should hear what I, uh, I said just no. now. No, no, sorry. Kind of, all right. I didn't hear anything. <laughs> sorry. sorry. No, sorry. And, uh, my screen kind of paused uh, just now at the moment. Yeah, technical issue. All right. Issues. All okay. right. Um, yeah, so uh, what I was saying just now was we're waiting for others to probably think up of a question. 
we have a question for you. All right, okay. For you. Yeah. So what is your advice to other campus communities that want to initiate water management projects like river cleaning or river rehabilitation? Uh, and like how to gain support from different stakeholders like university admin students and staff. All right, okay. Um how to start? Um yeah, that's very difficult. Um if you are shy, uh, that's quite difficult. Um, but for me at that time, um, I tried to sort of like ajak my friend so to remind me sort of like even though they, they, they don't want to do, to, to do the activity clean up so basically they just uh, tengok or at least just remind so that's that's keep me off uh, on doing that so um, if you're really passionate about it uh, if you really care about the environment uh, the rivers, you you just go for it. Uh, try to invite your best friends or your, your your girlfriend or your wife or families to be part of it, and and then it start grows. Um, and now, in terms of the rivers, uh, there's a lots of uh, what we call it uh, friends of river platform. So yeah, if you don't have friends, uh, you still want to do it. You can you can just go uh, the nearest friends of rivers uh, in particular areas, so you can get together. All right. Okay. So next is um, um, how to know whether the river ecosystem is healthy or not. Like, what are the elements or components that so uh, it's quite yeah it's quite it's quite broad uh so macam mana kita nak tahu is it we can use our five senses that's the simplest one uh, so you can use your eyes so basically you can use your eyes by looking at it is is the uh, is the colors uh, it's a cut uh, is a there's is it's a colorless uh water uh, uh the water is black or tetaric you can uh use your uh your smell you know to smell the water so yeah that's very basic so uh another another ways you doing your uh monitoring using kits so basically we um there's a simplest kit that you can buy. It's a low cost monitoring kit. Um, so you can test the waters uh, chemically. So, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, another question. Um, are nuisance mosquitoes a problem in the wetlands? If yes, what can we do to address it? All right. Okay. Um, so okay, from based on my project in uh, in the Green Belt, uh, that I think the surrounding itself uh, because there's a lots of trees. Um, we live in a tropical countries where we cannot avoid mosquitoes. <laughs> the best way to uh, to avoid mosquito is staying in a aircon aircon rooms, uh, but if uh usually if in the wetland try to introduce uh fish uh especially like for for example the guppies because guppies um is the bait uh, is quite uh, the 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 survival rate is quite high um and they can reproduce quite uh, a lot by the time so they will eat all the larvae so i think that's can one of the ways we we can to reduce the mosquito problem okay so all right we're getting more and more questions now oh all right um okay. <laughs> what is the best way to get rid of the algae then or referring back to the algae earlier on yeah oh get rid of the algae so so in this project, uh, uh, for the revival project, how we did it is by we have to drain, remove all. Uh, we have to 
remove all the waters we have to keluarkan air semua and then we have to disable the uh, the lake so because most of the nutrient are uh, being stored uh, stored in the sediments so if we didn't in, uh, remove the sediments the the nutrient is still there uh, the algae is going to be there but if it's a small pond so the best how to um, to do it is try to find it what's the cause of the algae so is it because uh, you feeding uh, you feed the fish because of the the food or is it because there's uh, external uh, pollutions so we need to identify that and by doing that uh, if we tackle the sources i'm sure the algae problem is going to be reduced um, Another alternatively, it, you can use wetland plants because wetland plants can absorb the nutrients. So there's a lots of wetland plants uh, species. Some uh, wetland plants, based on research uh, conducted, uh, there's a few papers you can read. Uh, the best, one of the best wetland plants uh, is Hangwana Mayana. They uptake a lots of nutrients. So we different different plants have different capability on uptake in nutrients right so that answers okay now going to facebook uh there's a question from now that is very interesting and it's the perfect question to ask Afan anyway. <laughs> so he asked what are the things that you need to prepare a basic water quality assessment that any people can do any suggestions Wow, assessment. <laughs> wow, water quality. So, yeah. So, basically, you don't have a, a you don't have so, sort of like have an equipment. So, like I say, um, the best uh, ways to define that whether the, the river is clean or dirty by just using our five senses. So, by doing that, that's a very basic and we can straight uh, get the answer if the water smells like a long kang, so must uh, the water the river must have a problem with silage and if you if you see the water is black and smelly most probably because of sewerage um, so by gathering information of the physicals uh, uh, physicals right monitorings it also helps to identify the problems. Uh, if you are interested um, more on doing sort of like to narrow down what kind of problems, so then we have a kit, uh, a kit, a monitoring kit, which is we can uh, identify what's the main problem. Okay, so the next question is from Dr. How to create a wildlife pond at home? <laughs> so how to create a wildlife? Um. So how? So basically, um, like the example that I show, uh, you can use a basin, basically uh, just a small basin, and then um, try to add water and a few plants, and let's see what's will happen so i i never tried it before uh, honestly um so i cannot based on my experience i didn't do it so most probably after this uh i will try to do it and i will show on the facebook page so basically you can like our facebook page and see how we do the pond wildlife pond <laughs> okay any more questions coming in please uh, we can grab like another one or two more questions so the next question um, to Afan is, is there any effort of people to unlongkankan a longkang back to a river? <laughs> That's so, my question actually. Mereformasikan melongkangkan. Wow. Yes. <laughs> so, so um, um, I, honestly speaking, I'm 
I'm always try to push this agenda to the development office, uh, especially in UM. So I will show that oh, ini longkang. Oh, kenapa kita nak kena buat structures, the concrete structures? Why do why why can't we have a earth drain? This is quite natural. Um, especially the seniors, uh, seniors civil engineers. They are quite skeptical uh, about this. I think because most of their times, uh, during that times, their opinion syllabus is more on channelizing. But I think the way forward right now, the the more the the, the juniors, uh, the young, the young engineers are more more willingly to listen about this kind of um, ideas. So um, basically, like examples, um, like Sungai Mustafa. The Sungai Mustafa it used to be a longkang, and people doesn't, uh, the development office doesn't do anything to fix the longkang, and eventually it becomes stream again. And at that time, we try to push that agenda. So we are looking more, uh, rosak longkang longkang yang dah rosak to push that agenda. Um, one time during, uh, I think last year, uh, I tried to push it uh, because one of the river bank in Sunai Pantai collapsed. So I tried to push that agenda by remove all the culvert. <laughs> remove all the culvert and try to make uh, a natural river bank again. But somehow, I think the cost that's uh, stopping them to do it. Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't think so. There's any more questions coming in. So yeah, that's 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 all for the Q and A session. Let's try online. All right. So thank you, Afan, and thank you everyone for staying with us throughout the session. Now we will share the QR code on the screen for feedback. We really appreciate it if you could scan the QR code and give us your thoughts on the series. This online workshop is also recorded, so it will be up on the social media platforms very soon. You can check it out on our Facebook videos, YouTube, and also IGTV on our Instagram. So before we end, if you are interested in learning more about UM Water Warriors, you can check them out on their Facebook and Instagram at waterwarriors.um. Another interesting fact about Water Warriors UM is that they are, they are also managing rumah number two, which is actually 16 in Salim Jaya. It is their office and you can also rent out spaces for activities and programs, which UBI has been based at throughout this session. So we'd like to take this opportunity to also thank rumah number two for allowing us to run our online workshop sessions here. You can check them out on their Facebook page at rumah number two, University Malaya. Um, okay, so do follow us on our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, Urban Biodiversity Initiative at UBI underscore MY, that's at UBI underscore MY.